We move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment, and I call Mr George Robinson. Question one, Mr Speaker. I have been advised that NIEA staff conduct patrols along the Roe Valley Country Park Path Network on a daily basis, during which litter collections are also undertaken. During these daily patrols, the staff also monitor and record any site defects or damage which they may find. If a defect, such as a fallen tree partially blocking a pathway, or damage, such as a broken fence, is found, this is reported to park management to ensure that it can be addressed as soon as possible to the extent that budgets allow. The daily site inspection process ensures the site is continually monitored on an ongoing basis to ensure that high standards are maintained as budgets allow. I have also been advised by officials that, as part of the ongoing site management, other seasonal duties such as leaf blowing and grass cutting are undertaken as they are required in accordance with the seasonal variation of the requirement. I can assure you that the local staff who manage Roe Valley Country Park take great pride in the management of the park and will continue to manage the park to the best of their abilities. This has been demonstrated through the three-star Tourism NI Visitor Attraction Grade that the park achieved earlier this year and the TripAdvisor Certificate of Excellence Award that the park has also achieved. Thank you. And I call Mr Robinson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister accept that usage of the Roe Valley Country Park, a popular tourist attraction in Lima Valley, may decline if upkeep levels are not maintained? this very popular amenity, including keeping paths open after trees fall, especially on the Lima Valley side of the park. And I do appreciate what the Minister has said, but it's complaint that complaints recently that I have got, particularly uh, fallen trees where the path is, is never cleared. And people are, tr are trying to uh, access the paths with, uh, where trees have fallen. Uh, I thank Mr Robinson uh, for the question. I think it's imperative that, that we, as a department and agency with responsibility for the park, do everything within our power to maximise uh, the number of people who can, can get access and who want access uh, to what is undoubtedly a very good tourist attraction and which does a lot to bring tourists to the members constituency and also provides a great area for recreation for people who live in the members constituency as well. As I said, staff are very committed to carry out daily site inspections after which or during which defects such as those uh, alluded to by the member are pointed out to site management and where and how budget allows these uh, defects are addressed as quickly as uh, possible. As issues such as fallen trees are obviously, or will hopefully, <laughs> beyond the control of individuals. However, issues such as littering, to which the, the member's original question ref referred, are very much the responsibility of individuals and those individuals visiting the park. So, <laughs> sorry, the more people we have visiting the park, the more litter is dropped in, in, in the park, and the more litter is dropped in the park, the less people we are likely to attract to the park. So it's imperative that the team there on the ground keep on top of, of the litter situation, and I, I believe that they do do their best to do so. Minister, given the uh, number of visitors that do visit the park, some estimated 350,000 per annum, uh, there have been long-running uh, and ongoing issues with uh, path maintenance, particularly on the western bank, and also uh, the dis damage done to the disabled angling stand at the centre in the park. Can the Minister assure us that those will be rectified uh, in the very near future? Uh, uh, I thank the, the member for the, the question as well. I, I had been aware of issues around the paths and ongoing work on the paths around the, the country park. I had said in my initial or second answer to Mr Robinson the importance of maximising accessibility to the, the, the park. Therefore, 
Uh, that's why I'll take the issue around the, the disabled angling stand very seriously and ensure that it is repaired as a matter of urgency. That's the first that I, I had been made aware of that, but I'll ensure that the team get on it right away. I call Mr John Dallet. Uh, would the uh, Minister agree with me that those who set up the Roe Valley Country Park in the first place and brought it to its uh, present state have created something which is really beauty beyond belief? And will he tell those who take their litter and drop it in the Roe Valley Country Park that they're the people to blame for anything that's wrong there? I, I thank the member for that question and again join him in praising the vision of those who established the country park and those who maintain the, the, the country park. With the issue of, of litter, yes, that is very much one, an, an issue of personal responsibility. And while the vast majority of visitors to Euro Valley Country Park and indeed any of the NIEA managed properties are responsible with their litter, binning it or in some cases even taking it home to recycle, unfortunately there are some less responsible who are happy enough to drop their litter or throw their litter wherever they may be, and in turn that demands that our litter patrols have to be carried out by staff on a daily basis. I would urge all visitors to NIEA sites, and indeed wherever they may be, to be responsible with their waste and not to drop it as litter uh, during their, their visit. We have discussed previously in the Chamber the cost to the councils of uh, street cleaning, back lane cleaning and, and so forth as a direct consequence of people dropping litter. This is money that could be much better spent, in my opinion, by councils on positive things such as, as play facilities and uh, items that our communities are crying out for. Thank you. And I call Ms Brenda here. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question two, please. <coughs> Whilst it is determined on a case-by-case -case basis, the majority of planning applications for wind farm development will be accompanied by an environmental statement. The environmental statement is provided by the planning applicant and is required to include information on the main effects that the development is likely to have on the environment and any measures that are required to avoid, reduce and, if possible, remedy significant adverse effects that the development may have on the environment. In assessing an ES, my department will consult with a range of environmental bodies and also the public. Given the detailed nature of an environmental statement, the consultation period can take a number of months and the consultation process can give rise for the need for further environmental information to be requested. Once received, this will also be subject to further consultation with environmental bodies and with the public. The ES remains a valid consideration until a final decision is made on a planning application. There may be instances during the processing of an application that will require information within the environmental statement to be updated. However, it would be extremely unlikely to be necessary to update an entire environmental statement. The information within an EES, the views of environmental bodies and the views of the public all constitute environmental information that my department must take into account in reaching a final decision on a planning application. And Mrs Hale for supplement. I thank the Minister for his detailed answer. And when planning services determine that an environmental impact assessment is needed, can the Minister inform the House if during and on completion of this scoping process that all findings of the required surveys and information are open to the public? I, I thank the, the Member for that question. As alluded to in my original answer, uh, not only is this, does this go out to consultation prior to the submission of the environmental statement, but subsequent to our deliberations on the environmental statement or the department's deliberations, it goes back out to, to consultation to environmental bodies and the general public. And it's often information from the public and indeed information sometimes missed by environmental bodies that, that cause the department to have to look closer and have to scrutinise even more some of the information that has been submitted 
uh, by developers with regard to applications. The, public, the details of the application are advertised through a notice in the local newspapers circulating in the area to which the site relates. The notice will give information on how the public can purchase an environmental statement and how my department has made it available for the public to view as well. Third parties generally are told that they have 28 days in which to respond to the consultation. However, any uh, correspondence or problems or issues raised with the ES will be taken right up to the date or, or, or minute uh, before the determination of a planning application. And I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister has indicated to the committee that following the publication of the finalised SPPS uh, that he will uh, undertake a review of the uh, planning policies for renewable energy, including obviously wind turbine. Can the minister set out for us the timescale of this re review, given the fact that local councils are now uh, developing their development plans? I, I thank Ms Lowe, the Chair of the Environment Committee, uh, for that question. Well, I, I can assure the member and indeed the House that the final draft of the SPPS was completed in March, as I had aimed for it to be. I had hoped for it to be published in April, however, and, and that's a target that, that we have missed. It was circulated in March to executive colleagues, and uh, since then I have made every effort to bring it forward for executive consideration. However, I'm disappointed and concerned that this extremely important document has thus far failed to be tabled at an executive meeting. The SPPS, not only will it, I suppose, its publication allow us to move on uh, to the, the review, the full strategic comprehensive review of PPS 18 and indeed PPS 21, which I know some members are very keen to see reviewed uh, as a matter of, of urgency, but it will also provide uh, the councils with a useful tool in the development of their new local development plans and will provide some certainty to those users of the planning system, not just planning professionals, but extremely importantly, investors who are considering making an, an investment here and across the 11 council areas. Therefore, it's my desire, or certainly my, my hope, that the SPPS will emerge from the executive relatively unscathed and will be published before the end of this term. And I call Mr. Cahill Boyle. Gorham Algot, I can call the Argus going break a selection area as Oct Aragra. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and also thank the Minister for his answer. But could I ask the Minister in relation to the EIA process, does he believe that it is robust enough and actually does stand the test of time? And when asking the applicant to apply that test, that it is as independent as possible. Uh, thank the, the, the member for that question. I do believe that the EIS system is robust enough. I am, however, aware of instances, many instances, where objectors to an application or objectors to an approval post a, a decision being made in an application will contend that an EIS process hasn't been robust enough and on occasion those objectors will be right, in my opinion. However, in the vast majority of incident instances, I would contend that the system is robust. I would also point to the fact that many developers, if not most developers, not just for uh, wind energy development but for other development, will uh, protest that the system is possibly too robust. And that, to me, is usually a good indicator that we're doing something right. <laughs> Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Minister, you expressed your concern about the delay in, in the single planning policy coming from the executive. But what are the reasons for this delay? Well, I, I, I thank the, the, the member for that question. It's, it's one I have asked myself and of myself uh, regularly. I, I, I'm not entirely sure for or of the reasons for delay. However, I am aware of the impact 
of that delay. The SPPS is an essential component for the effective delivery of the reformed two-tier planning system, which came into effect with the transfer of the planning function to councils on the 1st of April. As provisions apply to the whole of Northern Ireland, they must be taken into account by councils in their development of uh, local development plans and are material to all decisions on individual planning applications and appeals. It is therefore important that the SPPS, as I have said already, is published as soon as possible to provide clarity and certainty to councils and everyone impacted upon by planning decisions. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alec Maskey. Uh, Kevin Corlock, uh, KS Server 3, question number 3, please. In July 2012, my department initiated a review of the Local Government Staff Commission. The Staff Commission. Following consultation, I concluded that although the Staff Commission has performed well in a necessary and challenging role for 40 years, other developments mean that the statutory body of this type is no longer required. The Staff Commission's original role in ensuring and advising on fair employment has been overtaken by the development of other statutory provisions and, since other bodies carry out comprehensive scrutiny and monitoring, the Commission's role in this area is no longer required. I am also conscious that, as we have moved from 26 to 11 councils, expertise and capacity will be consolidated in a smaller number of stronger organisations. There is, therefore, a real danger of duplication of work between the Staff Commission and that of Council's own HR departments. One of the central objections of the reform process is to strengthen local government and to allow local authorities to assume more powers, taking responsibility for the well-being and development of their districts. It therefore seems counterintuitive not to expect the new councils to take full responsibility for the recruitment and management of their own workforce. I am confident that the other functions that the Staff Commission provides can be carried out on a non-statutory basis. This would have the advantage of each council being able to decide which activity they wish to continue to have carried out and by whom at their own initiative. I still believe that the Staff Commission will be required for a number of years to help reform bed in. There is precedent in other jurisdictions for using a body such as this to assist and advise councils during a period of reorganisation. And that's why I propose to dissolve the Staff Commission on the 31st of March 2017, two years after the councils it was created to support were superseded. In 2014, my executive colleagues agreed that the Staff Commission should be wound up in March 2017. Okay, can I just remind the Minister about the two minute rule? Mr. Maskey for a supplement. Uh, um, can I thank the Minister for that response? Could the Minister advise the House that in the meantime and up until 2017, what are the cost implications for the retention of the Staff Commission and who would bear that cost? Uh, well, there, there are cost implications. Fortunately, I suppose there are no cost implications for my department. In, in this financial year, the Staff Commission will receive funding of approximately £710,000 from the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and the 11 councils. My council, or my department, like I said, does not provide any, any funding for the Staff Commission. Additionally, the Staff Commission also administers funding of around £300,000 for the local government training group. This funding is used to provide sector-wide development programmes and courses from external providers. My department does not provide any funding for the local government training group either. While there will be no significant financial implications therefore for the department, council and housing executive contributions of around a million pounds will no longer be required post the 31st of March 2017 for the Staff Commission. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. For Mr. Speaker. At the publication of the Criminal Justice Inspection Report, I publicly welcomed it and thanked the CJI for its work. 
As I pointed out, when the CGI review was published, the CGI has recommended that NIEA enhance its enforcement and regulation activity and develop a more rigorous approach to dealing with environmental crime offenders. Their recommendations, as I said previously, mirror my approach, supporting and underpinning both my and NIEA's aims and strategy, and I welcome their suggestions. To ensure that these recommendations are established as smoothly and quickly as possible, I have approved the recent appointment of a new temporary head of the Environmental Crime Unit, one who has extensive experience in the criminal justice sector. Given the importance with which I view the need to tackle environmental crime, I am committed to ensuring this vital role is filled on a permanent basis as soon as possible. And considering what the report advised in terms of enhancing the professional development of those tasked with tackling environmental crime, I publicly stated that CGI had put forward some excellent recommendations. In particular, I would underline their recommendation that guidelines be developed for levels of enforcement and the rationale for the prioritisation of investigations. This will allow NIEA's finite resources to be directed towards tackling the most serious environmental offending. In addition, my officials are now examining how best to ensure that the recommended single environment incidental incident reporting mechanism can be advanced. I have supported and will continue to champion the need for a more straightforward system of public reporting. Put simply, the easier it is to let us know, the more likely it will be that people tell us about environmental offending and allow us to take action. It is clear that the impact of the of environmental crime on daily life here should not be underestimated. It is not, as I have said before in here, a victimless crime. Thank you. Um, I call Mr Anderson for supplement. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. Minister, during oral questions on the 21st of January last year, I asked about a report into the dumping of illegal waste at the, the mobile site in Londonderry. And your reply on that occasion was a promise to ensure a more joined-up approach between your department and other agencies, including NIEA. In light of the, the Criminal Justice Inspection Report, is this an indication of failure, uh, or could it be viewed as failure on your part? I uh, thank the member for that question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I do. And I'm not sure how anyone, if they had read the report in detail and read any statements from myself, subsequent to uh, the 21st of January last year could uh, view it uh, as such. We have radically changed and I'd like to think radically improved the way NIEA uh, respond to environmental crime, the way we deal with environmental crime and the way we deal with persistent offenders. I don't think it's job done by any means. I think there are further improvements uh, to make. Again, uh, as outlined in my previous answer, I think we could do more about prioritisation of incidents and cases and offenders, in my personal opinion, I think maybe there's a bit of time wasted going after small fry when there are much bigger fish out there, and, and I'd like to see uh, more focus on them. That's something I have made known to my officials. As regards our cooperation and collaboration with other agencies, that certainly has uh, improved. My boy, indicated what happened at Maboy demonstrated very clearly that there were huge failings there. They were again highlighted in the Mills report and the what had happened at Maboy. I said that at that time these incidents or an incident of this scale can never happen again and I'm confident that an incident of that scale will never happen again because we can't afford for an incident of that scale to happen again. I call Sandra Overend for supplement. Uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Does the minister fully agree with the um, with the review's finding that the the ECU has delivered considerable gains with evidence of capability and capacity, given the ongoing apparent uh, impunity that fuel smugglers and polluters uh, along the border area are able to operate within? I, I, I thank the member for that question, and indeed, fuel smuggling and, and fuel laundering is a source of some very serious environmental crime. Uh, this is one that in particular requires collaboration between the NIEA, the ECU and other agencies on both sides of the border. Up here you have the HMRC who, who are responsible for enforcement. 
uh, in collaboration with the PSNI and now the National Crime Agency and uh, uh, indeed the Environment Protection Agency and the Revenue Commissioners and the Garda Shihana in, in the South. The seriousness of, of this issue is such that it was actually raised as an agenda item on the NSMC plenary meeting on Friday in, in Dublin. It's something there's agreement on both sides of the border, but there needs to be an escalation or an intensification of how this issue is dealt with. It has huge consequences for the economy and for the exchequer. And uh, from my perspective, I'd be equally concerned about the consequences it has for our environment. Thank you. And I call Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, thank you. With the catastrophic failure at Maboy, significant inaction, it seems, on fuel laundering, and just two convictions in 2013, does the minister not think that the agency was let off very light by the criminal inspection unit? Well, uh, we, we certainly could do better, and, and I'd love to stand here and say we certainly will do better, and we certainly have done better in 2014-15 than we did in 2013, having secured 23 convictions in the last uh, financial year for waste offending. And in the same period, under the Proceeds of Crime Act, ECU's financial investigations secured four confiscation orders to the value of over half a million pounds. And this shows that the Proceeds of Crime Act clearly remains an effective tool, and one I'd like to see the ECU and the agency use much more, I believe. That's how you, you hurt these criminals. You, you hit them in, in the pocket. I've uh, spoken with the, the, the Justice Minister, uh, and we do agree that there is a need for the judiciary to review the sentences that, 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 that are, are out there for waste criminals. In my opinion, the, the punishment does not befit the, the, the crime, and un, until it, was, it does, uh, there, there are opportune criminals out there who will continue to exploit, I suppose, weaknesses in the system. And there still are some. I, 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 I don't deny that. But they'll continue to exploit those for their own profit and gain. Thank you. And call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Ever a Cougar, question five. Burning tyres generates toxic fumes and byproducts, which can be extremely dangerous to both humans and animals. I'm content that lead responsibility for bonfire management rests with local councils. However, I'm committed to working with and supporting the councils to reduce and ultimately eliminate the burning of tyres on bonfires. The Northern Ireland Environment Agency will, of course, use their enforcement powers in support of councils where they can. Whilst the legal position in relation to bonfires is complex and the relevant powers are exercised by a number of public bodies, including NIEA and local councils, I want to ensure that the environment is protected. In this case at Craigie Hill Estate in Larne, NIEA is aware of and assessing opportunities to determine the source of the tyres and will take action where possible. I call Mr Oliver McMullen for very very good. Uh, can, can I thank the, uh, the Minister for that question, uh, answer? According to the All Iron Used Tyre Report published in 2013, 30% of all waste tyres in the north have been disposed to unknown destinations. Will the Minister consider using the findings from this report as a starting point for investigating how tyres are being disposed of, and how existing regulations can be better regulated or indeed improved? I thank the, the member for that question. Uh, I would actually say that 30 per cent is possibly a conservative estimate on, on uh, the, the number of tyres or amount of tyres that we don't know where they end up. And I am certainly happy to, to, to take into account the findings of that report uh, when determining a way forward on this issue that is one that, that just keeps going round and round. My uh, officials are working closely with their counterparts on the south. We're looking closely at their development of a producer responsibility scheme. Uh, officials from NIA actually sit on the working group who, who, who are drawing up that scheme, and I'll be very interested to see 
how that rolls out and what we can learn from it. And should it prove successful, and I have no reason to doubt that it, it, it will, it's something I'd be very keen to see established here in the north, perhaps even on a, a UK-wide basis. And that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Uh, speaker. Will the paperless driving licences which have been introduced today uh, apply also to Northern Ireland? And if so, what actions has his department taken to ensure that motorists are aware that because of the advent of paperless driving licences, when they now go to hire a car, they will require a code which changes every 72 hours? And uh, has he informed uh, drivers how they will obtain such a code? I thank the member for that question. He couldn't get much more topical than that. It was just on the news at lunchtime there. I, I can assure the member and the House and the, the public that, uh, that, that the new scheme in Britain will not apply here. I have, have asked officials to uh, ascertain the rationale behind the, the introduction of, of the scheme in Britain and the doing away with if you like, of the, the paper part of the licence and to see if it is worth pursuing here. With regards to making the public aware that it, it isn't happening here, I have uh, just issued a press release just before coming into the chamber today to ensure that there isn't confusion out there and that people don't dispose of their paper counterparts uh, inadvertently or prematurely. Mr Wilson for supplement. Minister for his reply. Another part of the uh, driving licence policy, which does not apply to Northern Ireland, is the inclusion of the Union flag on driving licences. The Minister in England, the Transport Minister in England, has made it quite clear that if the Minister here uh, asks for uh, arrangements to be put in place, then people who wish to have the flag on their licence can have it included. What action, in light of the decision by the Minister in England, what action has he taken to ensure that those who wish to have that choice can have that choice? I thank uh, the, the member for his question. However, I, I, I do think he is perhaps <laughs> misconstruing this. Uh, yes, it could be extended to the North that everyone here could have the Union Jack included on their licence. However, choice would not come into that. Choice would not come into it. In order to set up a system whereby people would have a choice as to whether or not they wanted the flag on their licence or not, it would cost somewhere between £15 and £17 million. Pounds. I know that uh, the British government won't be prepared to pay that, and uh, we here certainly would not be able to pay that. That is the introduced choice in the, the rest or, or in Britain. So they are not going to afford us the luxury of having choice here whenever the choice does not exist to the citizens of England, Scotland and Wales, much to the dissatisfaction, I must say, of many people, particularly in Scotland and Wales. Thank you. And I call Ms Megan Fearon. Can I get, uh, can Corley, can I ask the Minister, is he satisfied that the workforce model that was transferred for the delivery of planning services is fit for purpose? Uh, and I thank the, the member for that question. I have answered questions in, in the chamber here in the not so distant past on, on the, 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 the very same subject. I am content that the model that was transferred is fit for purpose. However, that day, and it did attract some media attention after I'd given the answer, I says it couldn't be denied that some teething problems have been experienced and some councils more, more than others. I might add, I have to also say that with the transfer of the planning function, I also transferred a budget, and that's a budget that I ring-fenced from cuts to my budget and subsequent uh, r reviews and, and budgets agreed by the executive. Therefore, it is the one function that did transfer to local government at a truly cost-neutral basis. I have no, no doubt of the ability of the staff who moved over or the commitment of the staff that, 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 that have, have moved over to councils. Like I said, there have been some teething problems. However, I believe 
that they're now bedding and well and working well. Call Ms. Fearon for supplementary. Graham and I thank the Minister for his um, answer so far. Is the Minister aware that there is a huge backlog in planning decisions in some areas and it is having a negative impact, um, particularly in, in places like Nuri and Arma, and how does the Minister plan to tackle it? Well, I, I do believe, or I do understand and appreciate that, that there is a backlog in, in many areas, and I'd love to stand here and blame the new councils for all of that, but I know the councils inherited a, a, a lot of, of that backlog. Often the applic or applications that take long to process do so because they're pretty complex applications with re requirements from input from a number of consultees. And the more complex an application is generally, the longer it, it, it takes. I know uh, in the member's own constituency, for example, or, or in her new council area, there are an awful lot of PPS 21 applications that are sometimes quite difficult to determine. Well, if the planners had their way, they wouldn't be that difficult to determine. But I know uh, many cases in her own constituency where I've been trying to work with elected representatives from that area, with applicants, to, I suppose, achieve positive outcomes for the applicants. Therefore, that's a, a timely process as well. Now, though, as regards clearing the backlog, that will be up to the new councils and the planning staff there. And I, I have no, no further role in the vast, vast majority of, of planning applications. Thank you. And uh, my next question is to uh, Karen McKevitt. Could I remain, uh, Karen, that uh, as the Minister's Assembly Private Secretary, that your question must relate to, uh, specifically to a constituency issue okay, in which you're directly involved? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, is the Minister aware of any reports of significant decline in the hedgehog population within the South Down area? <laughs> Stole my thunder. <laughs> I was going to take that one too. I was going to say, uh, you see, as few, as few hedgehogs as you do down supporters today. <laughs> well, uh, I'm not aware of specifics for the South Down area, however, I am aware of reports on a, a, a huge decline in the hedgehog population across these islands. Over the past 50 years, I've seen re reported on television recently, there's been a 97% decline in the population of hedgehogs, and genuine fears exist that should positive action not be taken now, that this species could actually face extinction by as soon as 2025. That's a, a very alarming. Hedgehogs aren't something that we see every day. Unfortunately, generally, the ones that we do are on, on the roads. As Minister for Road Safety, I don't know if my remit extends as far as to making roads safer for hedgehogs, although I know that's an initiative that has been looked at in, in, in some jurisdictions. Generally, if we do see a hedgehog during the day, it's an indication that there is something wrong with it. Uh, I would be keen, as Minister for the Environment, to I suppose, undertake a scheme of sorts or a campaign to educate people around the potential, or not the very real threat, uh, to hedgehogs and their potential extinction. And I'm sure the supplementary will help us understand how you're directly involved in this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I did meet with the USPCA um, on this and have raised this issue. Um, and it is probably right across our region uh, where it is. And so I'm delighted to be able to take it to the floor um, of the, the chamber today. Um, you did touch on the plans that your department have uh, to help address this. Um, could the minister enlighten a wee bit more on those plans? I thank the member for that question. There are not so much plans of the department as plans of mine, although they will very much be plans of the department before long, I would hope. I'd be keen to embark on a campaign. I know a similar campaign has been embarked upon in England, educating people around the risk to hedgehogs, educating people what they can do to ensure the survival of hedgehogs and, indeed, boost the numbers of hedgehogs, simple measures such as maybe leaving out a, a shallow tray of food. They particularly like cat food, I suppose they prefer that to, to being 
cat food and cutting uh, ho holes in, in, in fences. Simple measures like that do a lot to, to help hedgehogs, particularly given the loss of habitat that they have suffered in re recent years. I would be very keen, I suppose, to maybe use the vehicle of eco-schools, which has been tremendously successful. We now have every school in the north here signed up to the eco-schools programme and, and, and using that vehicle to get this campaign out there and, and to educate children who are great at going home and educating their parents on such matters. Thank you. And I call Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. Uh, uh, can I ask the Minister specifically, and I know he referenced it in oral questions, but the single plan and policy statement, to maybe outline a time frame in relation to the legal advice uh, in relation to SPPS? I thank uh, the, the member for that question. And, and as regards to SPPS, I'm not entirely sure what legal advice that the, that the member refers to. I, I can't give a time frame as to how long it will take the executive to make uh, their deliberations on the, the, the document. However, I can give the, the member a commitment that, that as soon as they do, I will be publishing it. I think it's vitally important for the reasons outlined earlier that the data is done as soon as possible, perhaps, and their supplementary, if, if the member could expand upon uh, the, the particular legal issues to which he refers, I'll certainly do my best to answer. Thank you. And uh, Ms McLaughlin for a moment, and I thank the Minister for that. And I ask specifically in, in relation to advice that maybe relates to the policy around non-farming uh, dwellings in particular. Um, if, if there's specific advice, maybe he could allude to that from even from within his own department. Okay, well, good. Well, good. And thank the, the member for that, that clarification, which is indeed helpful. I do know the issue of uh, PPS 21, and, and particularly dwellings for non-farming rural dwellers, is one that her party has been extremely vociferous on. Over, over a couple of years, and it's something that they would very much like to see accommodated in this final SPPS document. I have met with a, a, a deputation from the Members' Party to listen to their views and, I suppose, hear their wishes as to how they'd like to see it accommodated. I have to emphasise, first of all, that this SPPS was viewed very much as an opportunity to consolidate existing planning policy statements as opposed to drastically alter them, regardless how <laughs> drastically or in what direction uh, you, you might want them altered. So legal advice that, that my department has received is that the, I suppose, wishes or aspirations of, of Sinn Féin as regards to PPS 21 would be it would be going too far to include them in the, the, the SPPS. However, I have given the commitment, and we, we touched on it earlier with PPS 18, uh, the renewable energy policy. It, along with PPS 21, I have committed to reviewing fully and comprehensively post the publication of the SPPS, and it, it would be through that vehicle that more dramatic changes could be made to each of those policies. And I know there are changes that a lot of people think are required. I call Mr. I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Right. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the minister to give us an update on the plans to increase the tractor speed limits? I thank the, the member for that question. I uh, just recently put out for consultation a, a, a document in which I am seeking to increase the maximum speed limit of tractors from what is currently 20 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour, or to be precise, 24.8 <coughs> miles per hour. It's, it's 40 kilometres per hour. I know Mr. Wilson doesn't particularly like speed limits given in kilometres per, per, per hour. He just doesn't like speed limits. That's <laughs> right. That's out. Uh, out to consultation. The consultation date or close date is the 7th of July, and, and, and I anticipate uh, quite, quite a number of responses and indeed would encourage responses from, from parties 
in this chamber on that as well. And I call for a quick supplementary. Thanks, the speaker. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Minister, have you any uh, plans to address the, the com maximum com combination weight of tractors and trailers? Because we have a situation as tractors are getting bigger uh, and heavier, then the situation could arise where you have small tractors uh, towing big trailers. How do you wish to address that? Yeah, uh, s such issues are also addressed in, in this consultation. And again, I would encourage people to have a look at that and to re respond to it. With regards to the view of increasing the speed limit, uh, it was remiss of me not to point out the fact that most, the vast, vast majority of collisions in which tractors are involved and in which speed is a factor are brought about because the tractor has been travelling too slowly. Minister, and time is up. And